Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, Stella. Well, hello, Sasha. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are. And I should also say lights, camera, action. action. Because <laughs> we're on video. For those of you on the podcast, you wouldn't know this. Yeah, I'm trying to think when we first began, did we give much discussion about video or not? I think we just immediately said, oh, no, 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 audio, audio, audio. And now yeah. two years later, we're going, OK, let's take the high jump. I think I was in my comfortable pajamas wearing a baseball cap and I said no to video. And here yeah. I am with freshly washed hair and a bit of makeup and we're on camera. Well, th that's our first. Everybody can watch quite quite easily how my 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 style will, will go down very quickly. I will be wrecked look by episode three in this visual kind of thing. I try my I best about at the that start. Too. Yeah. yeah, like I'm I'm wearing like nice clothes, but I bet within a couple of months I'll be back in my pajamas. But we never know. Maybe our audience will inspire us to to stay fancy. But we're back. This is episode one hundred. And yeah. this is just such a huge a uh, marker for us, just given how far we've come. And we, you know, in preparation for today, we just spend some time chatting and thinking back and looking at where we've come from. And obviously we were making some updates and changes, which is yeah. making me think about like how far this podcast has come. It's funny when I think back when we first, when we first started talking about doing a podcast, it was just blindingly obvious that we had to get the information out and it was like yeah. it was it felt urgent at the time we've got to do it we've got to do this we've got to do this but I often wondered like after we've done about 40 or 50 episodes will that be it will we have said what we've got to say <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought that might be it <laughs> I know yeah, that didn't happen <laughs> not at all we are never gonna run out of things to talk about which is I guess sad and also good because people are really enjoying it. For the most part, people really appreciate what we're doing. So, I mean, today, I think we wanted to just take almost like a walk down memory lane and think about um, how we even met, like how yeah. we got into this work. Because as we've grown, like what's been so cool to see is that the podcast has grown a lot pretty organically and a lot of new listeners may have no idea about like our backgrounds or how we connected or how we were kind of operating as therapists in the field they know us as these podcast people but really we're we're not i mean we we no. almost made the podcast out of a desperate need that we saw in the public but really we're therapists first and so i know we wanted to just kind of like talk about the beginnings the early days yeah. Well, you should go first because you you entered before I did, really. This okay. this this crazy world. So, I mean, when we were talking about this, you're like, I always have this image of you, yeah. Sasha, just like setting up this practice in Texas and having no idea like what's coming, what's I, coming down I, the pipeline. And in the image, I kind of have like some sort of cowboy street and like kind of tumbleweed. <laughs> and you've got this little <laughs> office thinking, I got to set up an office devoted solely to children with gender dysphoria. <laughs> And it's 2016. It was, it was actually a saloon with like a revolving yeah. door and people came in there and parked their horses outside Spit and did tobacco. therapy on the back of like a, you know, a haystack. Uh, no, Texas is actually nothing like that, but that's very Irish of you to say. <laughs> okay, so I guess we can start there. So, um... I mean, should I tell the story of like how I got interested in gender or do I start with like the practice? Where should I go? Well, yeah, a little bit of that. The, okay. Give a bit of background. Just just set okay. the scene there. OK, so so the scene is that I, you know, I finished graduate school in about, uh, gosh, 2009. 
So just to give people a historical context, and when I was in school studying psychology and studying, you know, counseling, the the way we were being educated about gender issues was very different than what training or counselors and training are experiencing now. Okay, so like when I was in school, I was very oriented towards uh, sociology and feminism, and I was really interested in like what at the time was mostly like gay and lesbian identity development. And so I kind of had my um, interest piqued by topics like that. And I remember being in school and learning about what was then called gender identity disorder. And I didn't give it too much thought. I, th I thought to myself, you know, basically what textbooks told us, which is that sometimes children have this really profound sense that they were supposed to have been the other sex. And I had a lot of compassion for that. I thought, oh my God, like, can you imagine growing up literally thinking you're supposed to be a boy or whatever, which you know very well because you did, yeah. right? And at the time, all I really thought was, it's so great that medical technology exists that can help such people experience more congruence and live their life. I didn't know anything about the kind of shady business within gender medicine. I didn't know about all of the poor outcomes that are not reported. I knew very, very little and I didn't give it much thought, but I had a great deal of compassion for anyone who struggled with gender dysphoria or gender identity issues. But I also, like I said, was interested in feminism and sociology. And so I was kind of weary about the way stereotypes played into this concept of like trans, right? And then if you fast forward, I worked in the world of autism for a long time. I worked with kids who have autism. I worked with adults with intellectual disabilities, and I worked with survivors of sexual abuse and domestic violence. Then I worked in a middle school. I was a middle school counselor there, and this was around 2014, 2015. And I started to have this kind of parallel process happening, whereby within the campus, I was leading our school's first GSA, Gay Straight Alliance, and I was hearing kids talk about identity with a lot of Tumblr speak, which I, in hindsight I now know. Like they had all this language and these kind of de definitions and descriptions and these like gender bracelets, and they were playing with identity in a way that was totally new, that was unfamiliar. And I noticed like they were also sometimes confused about like what it means to feel like a girl or feel like a guy. And at the same time, I started noticing like magazine covers in National Geographic with like a transgender child on the cover and like all this talk about the trans child, which was really interesting. So I'm watching all this go down and I start kind of going down the rabbit hole online like many people do seeing parents reporting my daughter out of the blue came out it sounded like a script and she and three of her best friends all think they're trans and like at that point i thought okay there's nothing completely crazy about this because teenagers often do take on the same behaviors and interests and identity exploration as their friends like that's not the crazy part the crazy part is that these parents were taking kids to their therapist or a doctor or a mental health professional, and they were suggesting that they affirm the identity and then proceed to medical steps. And that was the part that really blew my mind. So I'm watching all this happen. I'm witnessing this confusion in some of the kids I work with. And then a girl that I knew very well, I had worked with her for a couple of years, started saying she's not a girl anymore and that she wants a binder. And so... Long story short, after working incredibly carefully with her, her gender issues kind of went away. She started developing more friends at school. And she, in hindsight, I was able to talk to her like the next year or something. She said, you know, I think I was just lonely. And like online, I made all these friends that were really talking a lot about gender. But now that I have some real life friends, I, I don't think that was really me. So at that moment, I thought, okay, these parents have a need. I think I understand what's going on because I had really become obsessed with this topic by then. And I think people are just misinformed, misunderstanding. And like, all I have to do is set up a practice <laughs> and be reasonable, just be a normal therapist and write some articles and help other therapists who might be confused to like understand what's going on. And I think I can make an impact here. <laughs> and that was totally naive. Uh, I know, it's fabulous. And did you think, God, uh, will I have enough business and 
was that on your mind? Well, what what ended up happening is I started by kind of writing some articles and I think I was interviewed in like Fourth Wave Now or something and I started seeing a couple of clients in the evenings while I was still working at the school. Okay. And after basically just putting myself out there as a person that exists, I got completely flooded and inundated with emails, phone calls, crying voicemails from parents who were just absolutely terrified. Uh. And so I I almost felt, I mean, I felt afraid of diving into something that I really don't know if I was equipped for. And I don't mean in terms of my therapeutic skills, but just like as a, a business, like I had no idea yeah. how to deal with this volume of intensity and contact and people reaching out. This was all new. So that's kind of how things got started. And then after that school year, a side story is that within our school district, we had 13 schools. Yeah. And of course, thousands of kids on campus. And out of all the schools, there were four kids questioning their gender. And this was a charter school where families had pretty serious other kinds of issues. There was like generational poverty and trauma and drug abuse and all these things. And our our um, therapy manager, she was in charge of all the therapists across campuses, started rolling out these like trainings about trans kids, which I thought proportionally was strange given how many more complicated and pressing issues our population faced. And I was having regular meetings with her, showing her the data that I was, I was reading Zucker, I was reading Blanchard, I was reading all these things and trying to understand. And I was looking at the, the UK data about the 4,000% and like all of these detransition stories that were trickling in at the time. This is like two, 2015, right? And the way my manager, she was a very intelligent woman and she was a fantastic um, leader. But what she said to me was, Sasha, you know what? The pace of change with all these LGBT labels and definitions, it's just so rapid and fast that honestly, I can't even keep up. So I think that's why we need to just leave this to the professionals. And I realized unless I become a professional within the world of gender, I am not going to be given any credence about this information. So I, I realized at wow. that point that like, I actually have to become an authority figure in this world for people to take this seriously. Wow. Okay. And were you afraid of pushback at the time when you set up? You set up in 2016, um, was it? Yeah, I set up in 2016. To be honest, like we've talked about this a little bit, I think in our collective collusions episode, I don't tend to really care very much what people think or push back. If I, if I wrap my mind around something and I really yeah. believe that I understand what's going on or what the truth is, I kind of get fearless. Like in one-on-one -on -one conversations in my personal life, like with a friend of my fiance's or if you meet someone, I'm very careful about how I discuss this because I recognize how misinformed most people are. But when it comes to like my practice and operating with integrity and in what I believe, I don't really care what people say about me because I know yeah. what I'm doing cool. is the right thing as best as I can do the right thing as any clinician best, you know, as best as they can. So, so I set up my practice and immediately was just flooded with parents and families in need. And I recognized quickly, and I, I think we'll talk about this as yeah. you tell your story, that I can only help so many people if it's just like one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. I mean, there's a limit to how much I can support people that way. But I started recognizing parents need support. Parents need guidance. Parents and families really need a lot of help here because they're flailing. And it's like, oh my God. I, I felt like it was very important to give parents the calm, the grounding, the, the tools, the sanity to help them make decisions for their family. So I started moving, in addition to working with individual clients, I started moving into the world of like supporting parents. So yeah. let's let's stop there because that's like a well, long I, version I, of my story. I, I had did such... you know all of that or did, I didn't. Was I didn't. Okay. I didn't know all of that. I knew I didn't know everything, and I didn't know there was a few things there I definitely didn't know. So I'm kind of rattling them around my head a little bit here because I'm just realizing what a different introduction I had because 
Mm. I obviously, as a kid, had a very strong sense of uh, I should be a boy. And it, it wasn't a happy experience, but it was a very definite and clear experience. And I knew I'd be better as a boy. And I, I was very uncomfortable being a girl, hated being a girl. And it lasted for many, many years. And then I realized I had to pull out of it because I was a girl. And this is we're going into puberty at this stage. It would have started when I was about three. And um, when I was in puberty, I hated my body, hated everything about me, filled with not only self-loathing, but I was a misogynist through and through mm. from the age of three. Everything girlish like was just cringe. I, I looked down on girls very sharply. And when I realized I had to get mm. out of it because I had nothing that I, I was a girl, there was nothing I could do. Now, this would be kind of the 80s where there wasn't a, 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 a conceivable, reasonable option to transition. It just wasn't a, a reasonable option. It was kind of a farcical story you'd read in the tabloids. It wasn't anything else mm. in my in my world. That's all it was. And just kind of men, pilots changing and getting into a tablet you know what I mean that sort of thing nothing yeah. to do with where I was at at all and so I was just stuck being who I was and I hated being who I was and I did I remember puberty was a very strong lesson in um nature is bigger than you nature was just taking over my body and there was nothing I had I thought my force of personality would get me through and it I realized it couldn't. So that was mm. a very strong learning for me. It was very good for my character to realize that. It was a very lonely time. I remember thinking like it's humbling. It sounds oh, like a humbling, humbling time. Yeah. I thought my strength of personality would get me everywhere. And kids do think that. And yeah. I often think strong willed kids in particular might be inclined towards turning the tide with their force of personality I you know yeah. what I mean I think that was psychologically I think I wouldn't be surprised and I've no data to back this up but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of early onset children would have very strong personalities because they yeah they well, are insistent yeah consistent and persistent and confident enough to kind of yeah out out yeah. kind of to intimidate everybody into I'm a boy so, yeah, and then it was a very lonely time. I realized it was very much my mountain and nobody else's. And it was filled with shame and embarrassment. And I couldn't get out of it. And it took me many, many years. I didn't tell anybody about it. It was my biggest secret. My secret was that I'm trying to get out of it. Everybody knew yeah, that I was yeah. a boy. Everyone knew you You identified yourself yeah. as a boy. Everybody right. knew that I was this kind of tomboy boy dysphoric I don't know what the words they would have used do you know what I mean strange kid definitely yeah. <laughs> without a doubt strange would have been up there you know but I couldn't get out of it so it took a long time of me subtly I was trying to change it subtly tiny 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 bit at a time and uh looking back god bless me that I thought I could visually change my presentation one piece at a time mm. You know? Yeah, that's what that's like what nobody was... would notice yeah. if it was incremental enough. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly that was my my very vague hidden plan. Very out of touch with who I was, and uh, on it went, and life continued. I became comfortable in my own skin, and uh, very, very. I remember in my twenties, every so often it would come up, and I would say something, and another woman would say, "Oh, I was a tomboy," and I'd go, "Yeah, I'm going to stop talking about that." I remember sitting in a pub thinking, mm. "I'm going to stop talking about this because people are talking about something very playful and silly, while I'm talking yeah. about something really quite heavy and not." And I just thought this is demeaning and dishonoring my experience, and I just need to stop talking about that. I just let that wow, go. Yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. distinctly where I was sitting in a pub. So life mm. went on, and then. I did notice the the T being added to the LGB kind of scenario in the 90s. And I remember arguing with people in pubs. Obviously, I'm Irish. So all my life took place in pubs. But I remember arguing specifically, why are they putting in T here? That doesn't make sense. I remember specifically thinking, that's incongruent. One is sex and the other is, you know, who you are inside. I had no concept of gender identity. There was no concept. I, I, I had not. When you started speaking there, Sasha... I don't know when I first heard about gender identity as a theory, but it was somewhere mm -hmm. like 2017, 2018. Yeah, I yeah. hadn't any concept of a theory. All I had a concept of is a disturbance within me. That's, mm. And I presumed any time I met a trans person, they must have had that disturbance within them. 
I mm-hmm. had no concept that there was a whole other theory which had a very different way of looking at ha- my experience. Do you follow me? So I so had I, a, I wanna yeah, I just wanna on. ask, because you said when I would meet other when I would meet trans people, I assumed they had the same disturbance. So you're saying that for a time, even though you never did transition, you really identified with the experience of what are trans oh, yeah. people. So okay. Yeah. So any time from a child onwards a trans person came into my uh, view as such, my yeah. presumption was that they had had an experience like mine and m- transitioned. And okay. that was I my presumption. That. Yeah, I presumed that. Oh. I presumed that's what they'd experienced and they had gone all the way with it as such. They'd gone there. And I never thought anything else. That was my only understanding of 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 it that they must have. Are you gone talking through. about in your teenage years or as an adult when you've as an moved adult past all it? the way through? Yeah, any time mm-hmm. I read about it, any time I saw it, any time anything, it was like okay, they clearly had that experience, got hung up on it, and uh, stayed with it and medically transitioned. Did you ever think I wish I had? No, never. Okay. Very much thinking, oh, well, that, that just could proves have you're not really me. trans, yeah. Stella. Not so I never, I tra- never had a concept of gender identity and true trans. I never had it. It was never in me. It was like some people, they get into that place where I was and they don't yeah. come out and they use medical transition as their solution. That was always my understanding. And I, okay. I, I didn't have another understanding of it, if you follow me. And so, yeah. When I'd see people, I had a very distinct compassion for them because I could imagine how how intense it must for have been. For sure. Yeah, I always sure. thought, whoa, they must have had it hard. Almost like yeah. somebody else having had another kind of experience and you meet them and it's like, oh, you, you know, you grew up in Egypt too. Oh, right. Well, I, mm, I moved yeah. to the it's end It's like I could have gone down yeah. that road, but I but didn't. But I, I moved this yeah. way. Yeah, that's, I that's totally how I understand that. And mm. then uh, I noticed that kind of trans issue getting a little bit intense in the media. And I've said this a few times and I, I often write for the media. I, I'd, I'd become a psychotherapist in my 30s and I'd written a few books on parenting and I was very interested in, my first book was Cottonwool Kids, and I was very interested in the zeitgeist and the way par- children were being raised and the pressures on parents and stuff like that. And just before I released my second book, Bullyproof Kids, I thought, I must I must add my voice to this gender debate. It's, it's all very fraught and nobody seems to be talking about kids like me. All this mm. trans kid stuff and well, mm. what about kids like me? So I wrote yeah. an article saying, well, I had this experience, blah, blah, blah. And there wasn't much of a response, but I was asked to do a Channel 4 film about it. And it was funny because the first time they interviewed me, uh, I, I I just released my book and I was really not interested. And you often get calls, would you like to be part of the documentary? They never happen. <laughs> and so I didn't take it very seriously. And I was in my pyjamas in bed for my first interview. Okay, with me. <laughs> okay what is it? What is it? <laughs> and they were deadly serious. There's about five of them. <laughs> I didn't know they were taking it half as seriously. Were you on video? Yeah, <laughs> and this is unlike me. But I just released my book. I was all about my bullyproof. You were probably kids. exhausted. I was all yeah. about the bullyproof kids book. I wasn't yeah. remotely interested in the slightly off the wall idea of a, of a of a documentary about gender. So I kind of and I kind of flicked on like, oh hello, excuse me about this. <laughs> We have pajama (laughs) keyboard warrior Stella O'Malley tuning in from her bed in Offaly. I couldn't have been more like a days ago. And they, in in retrospect, they were asking very interesting questions that I hadn't Mm. thought about. And Mm. so they were asking things and I was like, oh, that's very interesting. But I had a lot of very thought out answers because I'd had a long time to distill what had happened to me. So they found me Mm. interesting and I found them interesting. And they said, Mm. we're going to come over to Ireland and interview you. And I was like, for real? Okay, right. That seems a lot of energy. (laughs) Okay. And I, I was so, what's the word? Flippant. I know I'm making a meal of this story. I better move it on quickly. But I I was so so flippant. I wanted them to come to Offaly. So they were coming from England. So rather than being decent and mo- travelling the 100 miles to Dublin, like a, a decent person, I said, could you come down to Offaly? Like, I'm really busy. <laughs> I'm in my pyjamas and I can't get out of bed. <laughs> I was still all about Bullyproof Kids. And uh, they came down and that day, that woman, 
who came and interviewed me. We spent the day talking about gender and I came out going, oh my God, that was fascinating. I She'd really penetrated my mind. She pushed me and pushed mm. me about all sorts of ideas. And I came out, I was invigorated. I was excited. I was talking with my husband. I was like, do you know, there was this and there was that. And she was telling me things and da, 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 da. And I was on a real like, oh my God, this is a very interesting subject. So that was my first kind of, oh, there's something phenomenally compelling about this subject. On we did, we did the film and it was extraordinarily interesting and somewhere in the midst of that I'd imagine that was the first day when I met her when she came to my house that I first heard about gender identity theory but it meant nothing to me I was like what mm. there's something in yeah me? like what yeah. the hell because how could that sit with where I was at I, you know it it's in conflict with my own experience if you follow me and so totally. then um, after I did the film, I was frightened. I thought there's going to be an awful lot of pushback. And I had a lovely life with my books and my clients. And I, I really was like, oh, no, my God, I'm bringing in a crazy. I'd never been on Twitter and I was scared and ugh, really. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just I was intrigued by the subject, but freaked out by the crazy language. Oh, you were. Yeah, okay. yeah. And everybody yeah. had me pumped. I was a year doing that film and everybody, this is 2018, everybody had me pumped. You're going to get attacked. You got every single person I asked, should I do this film? Every single person, except my husband, every single person said, don't do it, don't do it. Too, too fraught. Can, can I ask, yeah. by the time you did the film, because the way you're painting this picture, it's almost like you had your own experience that you've obviously thought about a lot. But like when you were approached to do the film, had you already been diving into all the research about like puberty blockers and like trans kids and like social contagion? Like, were you deep in that aspect of this topic no. or were you more just like, if this happened to me and I got out of it, what's going to happen to all these kids? I was the second. I was, okay. I was, I was very naive insofar as of the literature. And she asked me all those questions that made me just completely go well now let me think about that and mm. then she said something then she said about lesbians and I'm not a lesbian and I thought oh yeah I can see how that would happen yeah I, I get it you, you know what I mean it, it really rang very and mm. but it was news to me I remember it was news to me that a lesbian said anything to do with this I remember yes. her telling me about that so there was it was yes. all news to me but the research she handed me was uh, between that and the second interview was phenomenal. The research was really, really, really good. And I discovered a world. So the questions she asked me at the start and then the research mm. she sent me, she just and I ate it up. And around about then, um, if I'm right, Heather Brunskill's Evans first book was coming out mm. and that mm -hmm. took my head off. It was yeah. like, that was just stop everything. Just stop everything. Yeah. This is, do you know what yeah. I mean? So I was learning at that point. You know what I mean? But I, did, I came into it completely naive, you know. But then, yeah, oh. everybody had me very, very frightened. And um, everybody said, don't do it, don't do it. And my husband was funny. He was like, oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> That's him all over. Oh, that's great. I it love was, that he's so open yeah. to that. He was totally, go for it, go for it. And I was like, yeah, I, I'm gonna, you know. Um, there, there, there's yeah. a piece of my story I forgot. Oh, yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking about how this, your story is leading up to when we met. I reached out to Lisa Marciano before oh, I started yes. my practice. I heard her on Feminist Current being interviewed by Megan Murphy. And mid, first of all, she was the first person who was a therapist that I heard speaking with any sense of like nothing had resonated with me from all the affirmative people or like the extremely political right people sometimes yes but Lisa was just making so much sense to me and mid-interview I googled her name I emailed her and she responded quickly and that's kind of she was the first person that I connected with and I actually remember I remember saying to her I think I just want to keep my head down and have my practice <laughs> and do this work by myself. I don't really want to get involved with the broader thing. And she said, Sasha, when when the lid blows off of this, you're going to need a team of people and you're going to need support and you're wow. going to need like other people to have each other's backs because this is going to blow up. And I'll never forget, like that wasn't wow. the exact language she used, but I think had it not been for Lisa, I would maybe still be with my head down in a corner working and like you and I wouldn't have even been here probably.
I've always so, wondered, is there other people like you in Texas and other places <laughs> and they're quietly with their practice, but they're not online. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'd I'm imagine. Sh- I'm sure yeah. that happens. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so so let's keep going. So, so your husband yeah, tells you do the film. Go for it, You're yeah. getting into it. And um in the midst of that year, that famous 2018 year, that was the year I was like I was looking at things and I was reading about things and I still wasn't on Twitter. Like I was technically on Twitter, but I didn't even know how to use it. I, I couldn't do Twitter, but I was on Facebook. And somewhere in the midst of that, I saw Lisa Marciano's comments so how did she and I end up on each other's Facebooks I I do not know and I'd love Mm. to check that I don't know I must have looked up something and followed her or something and I remember I commented on one or two things she had written I remember she wrote something phenomenal about Carl Jung not knowing now that of course she wrote something phenomenal about (laughs) Carl Jung but at the time I just thought she's so clever this is so brilliant like I was totally fangirly and I said comments and she answered me. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, great. And I didn't know how to answer back. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. She's answered. <laughs> She's noticed my comment. And um, I was very shy about that. Very shy and very back. And I was called Stella Newallia. My Irish name was my my Facebook name. So I don't okay. know how we got into contact. Oh, wow. But that's how I found you. It was through Lisa's sash- through Lisa's Facebook I found you. And yeah. slowly realised that there was a world. I'd imagine once the film came out, so it might have been all around that November 2018 that she might have friended me on Facebook. And then mm-hmm. I got to know all of and we joined. I, we, mm-hmm. I remember joining mm-hmm. a group and all that. But I remember immediately being overwhelmed just like you were this 2018 November by a deluge yeah. of emails of, yes. of of these long I used to be frightened of my emails long harrowing stories of beautifully engaged loving mothers mostly mothers I have to say and just telling me these devastated accounts of families ripped apart of dev devastated children very distressed teenagers really really awful awful things had happened and really bad support for everybody involved and me kind of realizing okay wow I didn't really anticipate any of this I got a lot Mm. of uh, contact as well from people who had medically transitioned and were what I call lost in transition just yeah kind of I I watched your film I, I I transed 10 years ago it's very difficult I wish I'd known what now then what I know now Mm. I was like in this world of harrowing stories that I hadn't expected as much of I didn't expect yeah that I thought I'd do my film go back to my book release my anxiety book which was fragile the following April it was all going which is behind you for you two viewers yeah Yeah. and and, oh yes up there (laughs) yes right there I was going to roll on being a generalist. I was not going to get hung up in this gender thing, although it was very, very interesting. I remember you back then. I remember you saying that to me. (laughs) Wasn't going to happen. I just wasn't going to happen. I'm a generalist (laughs) at heart and I was going to stay a generalist. And it's a very interesting subject, but really, I'm moving on. (laughs) I just couldn't. I couldn't. Mm. The emails, all the emails. It was the emails that just shaped my life because you can't. I often make that analogy to you that I had a friend who, who was traveling when he was a student in college and he was traveling around Africa in the 80s and he effectively stumbled into the famine in Ethiopia and he was telling me mm. about it. And uh, John is his name. And I, I said, what did you do? And he goes, what could I do? I, I, I had to stay for a year. I just everything changed. I couldn't I couldn't not help. Like these yeah. people, it was obvious there was soup stations. I had to just suddenly just roll up my sleeves and help. That's how I kept on thinking of that story all those years later, just thinking, yeah, I, can, I can't not respond to this. This is this is extraordinary what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, like, it was also such a different time then, because, I mean, of course, we're recording this in January of 2023. The world has really started to take notice. We'll get to that later. But, like, at the time... In these, quote, early days, it was a very lonely place for us. There were no support systems in place. There was nobody talking about this in a way that seemed reasonable. We were really considered, like, 
very rogue, lone yeah. wolf. Um, honestly, I remember, I'll never forget, I had a consult with a parent who reached out to me because their daughter was going through this. And after we had talked for a while, the dad said, you know, Sasha, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first saw your website, I thought you were like a conspiracy theorist. I thought you were like an anti-vaxxer. That's what he said to me. And he said, but the more research I've done about all this gender stuff, of course, I realized you're right. But like, we seemed so out yeah. there at, at a certain point. Like, we were kind of like, along with several other key figures, especially in the UK, we were like screaming into the ether and nobody was listening for a long time. It was mad. And it was very lonely and frightening. I remember I felt very yeah. frightened. I was, yeah. uh, uh, I was, I was, I wasn't as up on the research as I am now. And so yeah. I just kept on thinking, um, what, what, what are, what are they all thinking? What, what is going on? It felt very disorientating. Mm -hmm. what, what is going on? And then I'd hear somebody like you and I'd read your writing or Lisa's writing and I'd be going, yeah, that makes very good psychological sound sense. Everything I've trained in, this is all exactly where I land. And I just found it stunning that other people weren't landing in such an obvious place. I remember I yeah. did a thesis um, on um, therapists' um, views of gender dysphoria. I oh, know that's how we met. I know. And I was, uh, I contacted a few therapists, yourself, Lisa Marciano, Bob Withers, a few others. And I was so excited about meeting you. I was really, really into it and I was really intimidated by you. And I remember <gasps> um, that I'd had this dreadful journey. My airplane had got uh, delayed and I was supposed to be like, let's say, meeting you at four o'clock on Zoom. But I was on the M50, which is a road in Dublin. And I thought, I have to get off. So I got off and found a quiet place in the hotel. It was the spa hotel. I was so stressed because this was my big oh. meeting with Sasha Ayat. Oh my God. <laughs> I was so stressed for that meeting. And you were lovely. And I remember everything you said. It was just like, yes, yes, this is it. Yes, yes, this is it. Like all I could think was this is making good psychological sense. So I was learning, but I was very quiet in those days because mm. I'd done my film and I was like, I don't know my stuff. And so it was a year or two before I would be very kind of um, opinionated about it. I was very like, well, we don't know and I'm not sure and we don't know. Well, you, you've know made is, up for lost time, Stella. You're very opinionated now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to really know it. And then when I knew it, I was like, I know this. I know this. I've, yeah. I've never felt more what's sort of knowledgeable about a subject. I've never felt yeah. more like I know my world. I know this world and I know it very yeah. deeply. But yeah, because of the deluge, no more than yourself, because of the deluge of emails, I started seeing people. But I was like, this isn't enough. This is insane. This is crazy. And I was really feeling it. A phobia was developing for my emails. I was like, mm. what? I got a new email address and it didn't stop it. So suddenly I had it coming at two different emails. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> and so then, then what did I do? I, um, I remember meeting this woman. I was at the D-Trans conference in Manchester in 2019. And I was, I met this parent who said, would you do a parent support group? And I says, yeah, sure. Thinking of when <laughs> of the second. At this stage, I it was just I was I was underwater with 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 constant demands and not demands but mm. requests and please, 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 mm -hmm. please, please help me. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, COVID happened, and suddenly all my engagements got cancelled. And I thought, I'll do this parent move. I'll do this parent oh, move. Yeah. yeah. And so I started the Gender Dysphoria Support Network. It was just parent groups, just meeting. And I remember the first night. I had this meeting, it was about 20 parents, all saying that devastating, harrowing, really distressing story. And I came down afterwards, I was in tears and I wouldn't be, I've, you know, quite hardened, I've had a long life and I wouldn't easily go into tears. And I was in tears after I came down, the fire was on and I was talking to my husband and I was like, that was just so horrendous. Like those stories, these parents, these families, they're being ripped apart. It was it was yeah. very moving experience. I remember just downstairs, just I couldn't speak about mm. what I had just experienced. I was mm. like, "What's happening? Something 
awful mm. is happening. Mm. And so on it went and, you know, we ended up, you know, running the gender dysphoria and it's still going. It's like Al-Anon. It runs its own groups, its own, it's all mm. parent kind of led and runs its own group. And then a You're year talking later, about the, the GDSN, the gender, GDSN, dysphoria, gender support dysphoria support network. It's great. Yeah. And they run themselves and it's completely parent led and it's, it's a lovely, very supportive organization. And then a year later, I realized over that year, that was 2020, COVID and all that, I thought... This, this, this is extraordinary. We need alternatives. We need an alternative to WPATH. We need an alternative. There was no other vision. There was no other yeah. options. And so we started Genspec then in 2021. And it's 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 not reduced. It's just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. But thousands more have joined. It's incredible. I mean, it's incredible the momentum that has been built up and, and what you have done with Genspect is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, how many, do you have off the top of your head a number of like, how many parents does Genspect represent or or how many groups? Or, I mean, well, I know 25, it's international. Yeah, it's 25 different groups from 23 different countries. It's phenomenal. And it's thousands. Yeah. It's thousands. We haven't got a number because it's hard, but it's definitely... Um, it's well into the thousands and it's, 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 it's huge. Do you know what I mean? There's a huge amount of outreach, which is great, but also very sad because every single person we're in touch with, you pretty much all of them have a really complicated, big Shakespearean story. You know what I mean? These are not little, you know, some people like out there and they have a, you know, the kid had a bit of gender distress and moved on. That's not generally who's in Jen's mm, This is it's mm-hmm. much bigger than that. It's people whose lives. And then obviously we moved into detransition and helping that. And now we're just kind of seeing ourselves as a kind of an alternative to, to the W path vision. And like there yeah. is another way to, to um, help people who are gender nonconforming. There's another way towards yeah. helping gender distress. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools, and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress. Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. And it's like, in the meantime, we've also had so many little projects pop up, you know, like we had a, it was like a Facebook group, literally, it was just a Facebook group. And it was a couple of us just saying, basically sharing articles and saying like, can you believe this? Can you believe this? Can you believe this? That was a lovely place. Yes, it was. I mean, this is a long time ago and (laughs) things slowly just kind of organically started to build. And I guess this leads us a little bit into like the podcast because, you know, you and I, we had connected when you were doing that thesis. And I remember being very starstruck because to me, your documentary was like, you know, when I would talk to parents and send them resources, your documentary was like the first thing I would send people oh. because it was just so important. I mean, it was huge. Did you know it was so, coming out before it came out, if you follow me, or did you just hear about it? Or At this point, I mean, it's, I have a hard time keeping track of yeah. the timeline of things, but I was always in the pipeline. So like, I would know, like I knew, for example, when L- Lisa Littman was of publishing course. her research and like, I mean, I was in the pipeline and knew when that stuff was happening, but um, I'm not sure actually with your film, whether or not I knew, cause that was pretty early days kept, in terms and we of kept our relationship. Quiet. Yeah, we kept it yeah. quiet. We didn't yeah. t- it wasn't well flagged and then it came yeah. out and I remember watching the mum's net comments and they were like what's this yeah. crap? What's this crap? And then some mm. of them were going, "Oh, well, this is kind of interesting." Well, kind of. <laughs> and you could see yeah. the kind of that the, they changed their view sure. as as the film progressed. Um I do remember one last thing though. I remember uh, we were 
uh, of that little Facebook group, we were going to do a conference and it was going to be in autumn. Oh, yeah. yeah, in autumn 2020. <laughs> and we, God bless us. It feels like back when we were young and innocent. <laughs> and <laughs> we were going to do this conference and we put so much effort and so much thought and so many meetings. And this is a world of a lot of, let's face it, a lot of meetings. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Um, we had all these meetings and it was intricately kind of uh, organised. And it was just coming up to March 2020 and it was the first week of March 2020 and I was sent off and I was going to book a hotel in Manchester and it was going to be fabulous. And I was putting the money down. This was it. This was like we'd done a massive level of pre uh, preliminary yeah. organising. And then I remember Ken Zucker flicked into the email saying, should we be worried about what's going on in China? And I was like, <laughs> really? Like, Really? <laughs> What is this delaying tactics? <laughs> oh my God, and I said, well, I, I, I kind of, I sassily kind of, well, okay, I'll, I, I won't put uh, the money down this week. We'll we'll see what happens next week. Next week. With like funny. an eye roll. You're like, oh, this is obviously going to be over in five minutes. China. <laughs> Little did we know. Yeah, and I was totally, and I said, I won't put the money down this week. And that was it. Bang. But I think actually had COVID not happened, you know, the Olympics would have happened and we would have had a conference. And I think it actually would be a different landscape. I'm not sure how it would be different, but I'm, I'm fairly mm. sure the Olympics would have been huge. Um, I well, believe, I mean, you know? COVID, COVID had a huge impact on gender dysphoria. Yeah. I mean, we did an episode about it early on. It had a huge impact on the mental health of young people. We saw some kids desist during COVID and then other kids adopt a trans identity during COVID. So now we I saw think, family structures yeah. change. I mean, so much was impacted there. Now I think about the timeline. So we were doing our conference in March, 2020. COVID happened. And by November of that year, we were basically putting our, our podcast out. So we well, let's had, talk about yeah. why. Yeah. Let's talk about why. So I, I remember by this point, you and I and Lisa and some of the others were in regular contact. And I, I was saying things like, you know, I just keep giving the same advice in these consults over and over and over and over. And over. We should probably just like put this information out there because all these poor parents are really disoriented. They don't know what to do. And these are kind of like back to basics parenting things. And people don't understand this gender thing at all. And I keep saying the same thing about yeah. like social contagion and masculinity. I'm like, we were just, we need to put this out because it's getting exhausting just saying these things over and over. And I think you were having the same experience. Yeah. And, and we were like, okay, well, let's it just. Felt, it felt out, urgent. It almost like out of goodwill. Let's just do this now because people need it. Yes. It felt really urgent. It felt really urgent. We were both really, really busy. Like this was mm -hmm. not something that like we were <laughs> taking time out. We were so busy, but it was yeah. like, this is the most efficient way to get a huge amount of information over. And then we started kind of getting visionary, like thinking we could do an episode on non-binary. We could do an episode on autism and then we'd be able to send parents to it. And that would, you know, so it was very much, it was like a public service, what we were thinking. Yeah. And we were yeah. very excited, but also I think kind of, could we do it? Like there was an element of like, dare we, could we, will we, you know yes, what I mean? Yes, yes. And like I say, I thought we'd run out. I thought we'd go through the subjects that we kept on saying, like, you know what I mean? R-O-G-D, da, 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 da. And we'd do our 50 subjects and then we'd finish and say, thank you very much. <laughs> That's not, That's what, not happened what happened. happened. <laughs> but yeah, I think we, it did, it, you know, we've been doing it for two years now and it has taken an awful lot of time out of our day. Like there, there's, Oh yeah, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> and you know, it's it's yeah. a, it's 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 a little bit embarrassing because you know I I had a shop and I consider myself a business oriented person. I do naturally. I like business and I I feel and and so does my husband. We we both like just chatting about ways and you know how how the world operates and you know what I mean what's the best way to do things. And I feel a bit embarrassed that we never really, on any level, capitalized really on the podcast that we just kind of just slogged through this podcast and kind of very much like I say, you know, I've always seen it as public service. It's great yeah. to have this information in one place. But yeah. we have done it for free for two years and I feel that actually perhaps we should we should on some level, I suppose we shouldn't be doing it for free. 
Or maybe we shouldn't be too, taking hours and hours out of our week for no reason. Yeah. Something like that. Well, I mean, I think, I think what really strikes me is that without really any targeted assistance in terms of getting the news out there, marketing, we have become pretty successful yeah, in terms of our listeners yeah. and our downloads. Like if we look at the numbers here, what's amazing is that we have um, in this website called Listen Notes that kind of ranks podcasts, we're ranked within the one top 1% of podcasts, Mad. which is nuts. First of all, we're a podcast that covers an incredibly small niche topic. Now, of course, culturally gender has blown up and it's like this thing that everyone's kind of seeing, but how does a little podcast about gender made by two therapists <laughs> with no help no. become a, you know, one top 1% 1 of podcasts? That's amazing. And I'm like kind of in awe. And I, I mean, we have to just say like our listeners are so incredibly supportive and dedicated and encouraging and like not a week goes by where somebody doesn't say by email or in a phone call your podcast changed oh everything for us yeah and it did That's do unbelievable. it did do what we wanted it to do which was could you listen to this podcast could you listen to that like all those emails finally between the gdsn between gen spectrum and the podcast i don't feel freaked out of my head when I get an email. I just right. flick them over the resources very confidently. Bang, bang, bang. This will help you. <laughs> yeah. And while I used yeah. to go, I'm so sorry, I can't fit you in and I, I don't know where what you should do. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. <laughs> do yeah. you know what I mean? Now That's it's it like, well, we actually covered that in a great yeah. deal of detail and depth <laughs> in these yeah. six podcast episodes or Thank whatever. So it feels God. great to have something to give yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. We have... We have 830,000 downloads. That's phenomenal. That's nearly a million. I know. I know. 294,000 unique listeners. Almost 300,000 unique people have wow. listened to our podcast. That's and amazing. every one of you is unique and special, by the way. Very Unique, special. literally. <laughs> and, you know, almost 6,000 Twitter followers. Yeah. And I thought it'd be fun if we just kind of look through some of the um, reviews that we've had about yeah. our podcast and read them because yeah. we're, we're, we were looking we wonder this, if... This is this amazing place which brings all the pod, all the reviews together. And how many did yeah. you say? Did you say 690 or something? 691 reviews. And Imagine. they kind of pool reviews from all these different platforms. And they're funny the because they're either five star or one star. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, no totally. I don't think we got any three star. <laughs> five, yeah, five, 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 like, one, one, five, one, yeah. five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the it's like a 691 reviews and the average is 4.5, but we know that it's like a lot, a lot of fives and like a few really angry ones. Yeah. And I mean, we shouldn't laugh, but some of them are pretty hilarious, the, the one stars. But do you want to read some of your like my, favorite, my favorite positive one star, reviews? My favorite one star. Oh, was you're going to start with the one sorry. star? <laughs> well, just this one. It just said, warning, yes. warning. <laughs> yeah yeah warning yeah this is very I, I, intricate. I don't think we need a warning i think we i think we're, <laughs> yeah what what would you read out one or two i've got a few up here. okay okay let me pull them up here oh there was a really um, cute one about you sasha can i read this out uh, oh, okay <laughs> it was so lovely one of the top five podcasts i've ever heard this show is such a breath of fresh air stella o'malley is fun and easygoing but she knows her stuff and has a personal history that is relevant and interesting sasha ayad is one of the most thoughtful people i have ever heard i'm constantly surprised and enriched by her ability to see things from every angle and really find truth and knowledge in unexpected ways i just think she is so incredible and i may in fact have a kind of crush on her just like me <laughs> Oh, that's very cute. <laughs> it was. Um, I thought it was gorgeous. It is nice. Okay, let me read one that I like. I have it here and I took a screenshot of it. Um, okay, the best podcast on this issue. Thank you, Sasha and Stella, for your calm, curious, sane approach to this issue. You have led me to all sorts of further research as I've looked further into your guests who deep dive with you into so many facets of the trans debate. Your kind voices keep me from panicking as I go through this ROGD journey at my house. For so many parents, you make us feel not alone, like we're not going mad. Your approach offers a kind of 
breathing space to slow down the conversation, be respectful with our kids, your compassionate understanding of teens is a hallmark of your show, as well as compassionate with ourselves. You shine a light on all kinds of connections and ramifications, intelligently, warmly, and reassuringly bring your years of therapeutic experience to the discussion. All the power to you. I know. So nice. That was coming from Australia. One of yeah, the countries it was it was interesting to see the countries because Little Ireland is in the top ten, which is pretty amazing because like there's three hundred thirty yeah. million people or something in America, there's six seven million in Ireland, so <laughs> we're doing wow, well, Irish listeners. Yeah, 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 that was really I was thrilled to see that. There was one um one interesting one. I think it's a one star. Um, okay, so I'm a trans person, okay, and I think a lot of these episodes are okay. And perhaps helpful. But please, I swear to God, please don't be promoting this idea that ROGD is real. Okay, if you ask Mm. 99% of actual trans people, they will tell you it is not a social disease and that trans people just tend to be friends with other trans people because in a world like this, we stick together. Also, for for God's sake, the amount of misgenderment and transphobic comments I've noticed are a bit ridiculous, just please. And if you're a parent of a trans kid, get information, please, for your, your kid's sake. I, I just thought um, it was kind of interesting straight into that whole ROGD is. Yeah, I, I, I always find that really shocking because I just think, wow, the, the ROGD just followed the f- the phenomenon. ROGD just followed the f- the phase, the kind of the extraordinary yeah. explosion and described what what people were, were, were reporting. And to say it doesn't exist is just a, a, such a strange way of looking at things. Yeah. You know, because obviously well, it exists. I mean, <laughs> I made that kind of joke earlier, which out of context probably sounded bad, but like, well, you weren't really trans in the first place. So, yeah. I mean, you know, this, this idea that, I mean, we've covered it a lot and it's just a ridiculous idea that like there's some essentially true trans person and therefore, those people need to be affirmed I, right I away. I think there's I a, mean, fu- a fundamental conflation within a, a lot of people who haven't, I believe, well, maybe they have given it a lot of thought, but there's an awful lot of disengaged people who haven't given it very much thought and just presume it's it's being gay. And that they haven't really thought very much about it. But what does that mean to say that you're trans? I'm like, well, what is it inside you? I, 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 I've never heard a good response to what could be inside you is it some sort of kind of scarlet pimpernel within you that makes Mm. you try do you know what I mean what is what could it be because like if you're an atheist you just think I'm just flesh and bones what Mm. what could be inside me I I don't what do you know what I mean it feels very divine if you follow me yeah yeah. yeah, and it's hard because I think, again, like to to somebody who has not been digging into these issues for like all the, these years, it's going to sound very flipped to hear that. Like, what are these people saying that there's no trans people? And of course, there are people who yeah. have transitioned or are yeah. socially transitioning. And of course, yeah. that that ostensibly, in my mind, makes them trans. trans. But I don't I don't believe in this idea that there's some true essence and our goal as therapists is to pick out the real ones. I mean, I think that's actually quite, and you said it, it's quite authoritarian. And yeah. I think that's the problem. And who am I to say you are trans and you are not? I don't like the, uh, the, the former model that used to be where two psychiatrists had to kind of sign off and decide yeah. you should trans and you shouldn't and you should and right. you shouldn't. That's very authoritarian. I don't see where I, I can't see that being a, a way forward. I'm much more interested yeah. in a kind of a public awareness campaign where people realize medical transition is a very difficult road. It carries a very heavy medical burden, which you can choose to take. But, mm-hmm. the, you know, this mm-hmm. is how it will look like. And, you know, these are the, mm-hmm. these are the challenges and this is how it will look like. And there might be other roads you might choose to take and go proceed, yeah. proceed cautiously. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's that's where I would like it to ultimately go towards. I don't know whether yeah. it will, but I think it will. Well, I think right now what's happening in the culture is we're starting to see that. Well, at least we can say rushing people into affirmation has serious consequences for some. And we know that that is not working very well. So I think it's inevitable that we take a different look. Um, but this is that's kind of the meat and bones of the show. That's what we're usually covering. But I want to talk a little bit today 
about what's coming because oh, yeah. obviously one one <laughs> big change is that you're seeing our faces now on video. I got to get my have- Vader. <laughs> <laughs> Not before time. Yeah. Stella's gonna become uh, very like self obsessed here get in front of the camera and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So we're, we're on video. That's obviously one thing. I mean, like, you know, Stella, of course, you, you do have a business sense, probably much better than I do. But at the end of the day, like at our core, our real strengths are our therapy, our therapy conversations, our batting around ideas. I think that's reflected in the reviews we just, li- you know, listen to. But without really much help, I think there was almost like a ceiling for where the show could go. Not so much because we lack the ingenuity or the ability to think about it, but time-wise, like you said, we are so busy that we just barely kind of figure out what's the next episode. It was like really like a fly by the seat of our pants, like scrambling to get guests and doing all the admin work on our end. So we really needed some help. And what's really amazing is we've kind of gone through this huge experience on our own. We built this podcast and those were really precious days for us where we were just like, like you said, in this, can we do this? Mm. Are we capable of doing this? And we have done it and we've done it in a way that I'm very, very, very proud of. Yeah. And so I think like, I feel a responsibility now that we have, we have this evidence that so many people find this valuable we have a responsibility to actually take this show and make it even better and think even more deliberately about like the yeah. content and series and topics and like who we want to have on and how we're going to structure the timeline for the whole year rather than like, yeah. oh crap, what are we doing next week? I know. And we have uh, been fortunate enough because we've got such, I have to say our, our listeners are phenomenal and they're Amazing. so dedicated and they're so informed and they come up with some brilliant ideas. And as a result, just in the last few weeks, as we took that break, which was a great thing to do because it really, yeah, it just calmed us. And we thought, where are we going with this? Where are we going to go? Yeah. What yeah. do we do? And we kind of came across this great team. We've kind of assembled a team as such who, who are from three different people to add to you and I. And their ideas are great. And it's like, we could bring this to a whole new level. We could actually bring yeah. this to a to the public. Because right now yeah. we're, we're in world. And yes. I, I think we're very in world. And we're doing well in world. It reminds me of Velvet Underground were a band in the 60s. And they, uh, they had, they, they apparently they sold a thousand albums of their first album. And ap- apparently the, the legend has it that every single person who bought one of those albums started a band so their (laughs) their impact was very far reaching but they didn't get money and I kind of feel Mm. we're a little bit like that that everybody who listens to us really gets involved and informed and really involved but we need to get to the public we need to get beyond that thousand album kind of thing even though we are in the Mm. top one percent and that's from no marketing that's from seat of the pants what do we do next week what do we do next week but now we have our team I think we can really expand into actually being maybe more deliberate and maybe more uh, concerted and uh, organized and specific. The Pioneer series stood out as what we could really do if we really think about where we're going. Yeah. And as we've brought on these team members, um, many of whom, well, there's three people, two of whom are ROGD parents and they really understand this issue deeply. They're devoted listeners of the podcast. They're people who have been following us from the beginning. And frankly, we had so many people volunteering in in different ways to help us. I mean, we were really fortunate and so grateful, but we feel like these brilliant women really need to be taken care of and we need to be able to give back to them because they've given so much to us. And it's not just that they're dedicated to the show. These are brilliant people in their own respective fields, like top-notch yeah. thinking, top-notch experience, top-notch strategy. And so like every time Stella and I have been meeting with these women to talk about the show, we're both like our minds are blown yeah. with the brilliant ideas <laughs> and just savvy, savvy understanding of like how internet marketing works and like all these things that are a little bit, at least I can speak for myself. They're way above my level. Yeah, of me too. So 
We're, we're just so excited to be more thoughtful and deliberate so that Stella and I can plan out content. We can really think about what we want to put out. There's so much information that needs to get out there that we, is that we're still not able to really do. And, yeah. And they have all these ideas about how we can bring in a community and create yes. this kind of uh, network community, which I think will be a game changer, really. Yeah. I mean, some of the things we have on our radar are having kind of like new segments of the podcast targeted towards specific audience. So like maybe a whole series for school professionals, yeah, another series for clinicians, maybe like more organized and curated um, organization on our podcast or sorry, on our YouTube channel so that you could go in. And if you are a new parent, here's going to be like the start here section. So you know, all of these kind of basics. Yeah. We also are going to have trailers made out of our podcast episodes that are targeted and specific. So if you want to see like, what do Sasha and Stella have to say in a 10 minute video about social contagion? Here's where you go. So these are going to be very shareable, especially on YouTube. This is the platform that is probably the most shareable when it comes to how to give information to others. So like having this team will allow us to really curate material that is easy to share with like your teacher, or with your school counselor or whatever. So we're just so excited about that. And, and coming onto video means that you'll be able to see our expressions. Yeah. Like how many times have we been in an interview and the guest says something and maybe you and I both kind of are slack jawed and we're like shocked by it, or maybe we're both tearing up or whatever. And that's not something that you can necessarily pick up from audio only. So bringing in the video element is going to be such a <laughs> an enriching I, kind of like few deep experience. There's a few interviews I would have loved that we did we did visualize and one that jumps to yeah. mind would be Anne Lawrence. I, I wish that oh, yeah. <laughs> we're like, Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a few others. I'd love to have had uh, the Steensma and DeVries interview visualized. I, that, that was very interesting because it was very intense and it would have been great yeah. to, to, to watch the expressions of stuff. There's some that yeah. jump out that would have really benefited. And I'm, just think it's going to add a depth of understanding to where we're at. Because sometimes people have said, you didn't push back and all that. And I'm like, well, we're mm. therapists. We don't push back. We bring out. We, we, we right. try, what, what we're trying to do is bring out the person. We're not trying yeah. to push back. That's not really what yeah. we're trying to do at all. Yeah. We're not like some sort of investigative reporter. Exactly. That's not our vibe. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I want to talk for a minute about the community revamp. So like as of now, we have a pretty awesome Patreon. It's it's not um huge yet, but it is growing. And we put all kinds of bonus content in there. So we have our transcripts available. People sometimes prefer to read through the transcripts and then watch the video. And we have our Q&As, which are great, like submitted by listeners. But we are completely revamping the community feature, which is really big because what I have noticed from working with parents, and I'm sure you see this too, and listeners in general, is like people, when you feel like you are part of a small community, a minority viewpoint, it's very important to have other yeah. people that you can connect with. How many times do you hear from people, whether it's a trans person or a parent or any, any teacher who says... I feel very strongly about these issues, but I have nowhere where I can talk about this in my real life. So revamping our sense of community on these platforms is going to be so important. So yeah. like we have the the you know help that we've brought on who's kind of acting as our producer. Our team, Sasha, our, a, team. our team. Our team, our <laughs> team. But I mean, this person I'm thinking of, she's like our producer, yes. right? And she's completely revamping the community feature. And yeah. we're so excited because everybody who's been with us so far is going to feel like we really roll out the red carpet when we step it up and we have like a much yeah. better sense of community for them. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be building groups that are maybe curated. So like within, we may be shifting from Patreon to another platform, but basically whatever platform we end up on, we might have communities that are more niche. So like maybe by your age or your sex or your location, or maybe like a parent group, or maybe a dysphoric people group, or maybe a trans people group. So we're going to have like different little niches so that you can really feel like part of a community and connect with other like-minded people. So we're thrilled about that idea. Yeah, because I do, I, uh, it's such a lonely road. It's such a lonely 
lonely road, for, especially for parents, but it's it's so lonely, not only for parents, a lot of people who are involved in this and they just think I, I've only got people online to talk to because other people don't get it. And you can yeah. feel like you're on one side of, of a fence or another. And it, it can a lot of people talk about how their friendships seem a little bit empty when they're talking about somebody who doesn't quite get what's happened because it's a phenomenon. It's a, a very yeah. big event when people start yeah. kind of delving into it. I think these platforms are going to be really, really exciting because we've grown a, a kind of a, a wider lens community and we haven't yes. brought it together. And now we're yeah. going to bring it together. And I, I think this is going to be very heartening for people. I think so. And I think like one of the biggest things that has been on our radar, and to be honest, this is one of those things like s people have proposed this to me so many times and I've kind of batted it away because I'm too busy, but we need content for young people. Oh, we need so a important. course yeah. for dysphoric kids. We need a course for 19 year olds who kind of realize that the activist rhetoric doesn't make sense, but they don't want to be demeaned or made fun of by like extremely conservative kind of pundits. Like we need therapeutic, respectful, interesting, rich yeah. content and courses and programs for young people. And I think having support both through the team and listener support will give us the space to actually work on this because this is probably like the number one most requested thing that we just don't have the capacity to build because we're so busy. Yeah, and until now we didn't have the brain space, but now we have our team. Yeah. To, I know I'm overstating this, but they're doing all that they're stuff. They're amazing. All yes. that, oh my God, that tech, which frankly, let's face it, you definitely showed it <laughs> a much bigger burden than I did. But I found the whole thing just brain achingly difficult. Do you remember I had to do the quotes or whatever? Oh God, the quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, oh, thank God they're, they're going to do it. But we'll be able to do what we're good at, which is I yeah. just think like I think when 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 somebody comes to that reckoning of I am not going the way I thought I was going. I'm going a different place and it's very frightening. I've been there. I was young when I was going there, but it was very frightening and very lonely. And uh, yeah. it's a very cerebral, it's a very brain space of what? Who yeah. am I? Where am I going? What? It was yeah. everything I've been thinking for years different to what it is? Mm -hmm. And that reckoning, it's a very private reckoning. I want to feed that. I want to be there. I want to be able to kind of talk philosophical psychological kind of really quite deep points about yeah. what it's like to yeah. be in that place where everything you know is wrong everything you think is is different it's a frightening yeah. place and I really want to reach people just like I used to well I don't I still do but I used to really want to reach those parents because I just thought they're so lonely mm -hmm. I just want to mm -hmm. speak to them now I just think there's a whole other group especially I think 18 to 25 but whatever that group of people who are yeah. Just suddenly looking around them and thinking, I'm frightened and I'm not sure of myself here. Yeah. I mean, I hear this all the time from young people who have been in therapy with me for years. They say, I can't talk to my friends about the things we're talking about. And they know that, that the, the information they've gotten from certain kind of online you know, resources is superficial. It's not 100% accurate. It demeans their intelligence. So like there is a, a huge need here. And I think for us going on to video is a big, is a big factor because young people, when they're looking for information in my sense are more likely to look on YouTube than they are to like look at a podcast. Oh, so yeah. for us having this video person working on our team and being able to chop up some of our conversations and have clips, I think that will really help get this information into the hands of young people. And as we like another thing I love about our new producer is like she's really good at analyzing data. So as we start to figure out what is resonating with young people, we'll have a better sense of like how to put together resources for young people that could really have an impact in their lives. All this to say, bringing on three new people and stepping this up to video is a really big ask on our show. And we've really just done this. We've just scrambled together the time and resources to make this show. 
And so we're, we're also asking like, if you're a listener and you've gotten value from our program, or you have felt that this has helped change your perspective on like how to deal with gender issues in your family, like you can really support us and it would make a huge difference so that we can grow our show and grow our team. Like in asking for your support, we're not trying to fly to the Bahamas and party. <laughs> We're trying to get gender a wider lens to be at a higher caliber of quality so that we can keep pouring in like more of ourselves into the show and making sure that it's getting out in front of the right people. So yeah, like we've done it for free for two years and we intend to keep doing it for free, but we would like to get the production up to get the team. Yes. Up. That's where we want to put the money if we get any money and we would like to get supported. We would like to be kind of appreciated a little bit yes. for what we've done because yes. we really, our hearts are, are in the right place. We're certainly trying to do the right thing here. And I yeah. do think that it it could, it, it's great. I love our podcast. I really am very, very proud of it. And I think it could be better. I think it, I yeah. think I can see where it could go. And I think it could be so helpful. It's already yeah. very helpful for parents and I think it could be helpful for lots of other people as well. For more people, yeah. yeah. More we groups. really want to be able to grow and, and kind of capture the attention of different people who frankly are concerned. I mean, that's the thing that really drives me is like when people reach out and say, I'm a school counselor. This happens all the time. I'm a school counselor and your show has really helped me understand what's going on with the kids I work with. So it's not just parents who appreciate and find value in our show and, and dysphoric people have written us saying like, you've really helped me explore and understand yeah. myself better, like whether or not the person decides to transition. So these are really valuable things. And so if you can support our show, we will be so excited to bring you something even better as we move into 2023. And if you go to our link tree, you'll find a button there that says support our show. So that's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod and any support is deeply appreciated even if it's something small we know so many people are generous and care about our yeah. show and will support us and that makes a huge difference and really it makes a difference we, we 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 are we have great vision and we don't know how much we'll be able to pull off and it will very much depend on how we get supported over the next couple of months we believe in you though we believe in you yes. listeners <laughs> We really do believe in you. <laughs> and we, we, we think that we are going to get supportive for this vision because we've kind of earned our stripes in the last couple of years with this. And we feel that like there's no reason why this couldn't become very curated and incredibly helpful to other groups. Like I say, both of our both you and I have landed right at the same time with we've got to get some resources for young people. But not yeah. only that, there's yeah. other groups that we want to schools is a biggie. Schools is a biggie for, yeah. in my mind. But it's exciting that finally the world is waking up. I think WPATH, you know, releasing their standards of care and it really was very sub substandard <laughs> standard of care. Um, I think mm. the world is waking up that there are other ways to approach gender related distress. There are other ways to understand yeah. gender dysphoria. And so the time is now. Now is the time that we need to kind of come into the public, into the mainstream with our little podcast. Yeah, thank you. It was great to see you guys on YouTube. And for <laughs> those of you listening on podcasts, maybe you'll pop over to our YouTube channel and check us out, critique our outfits or whatever you uh, do. Oh, don't do that. On the internet. <laughs> Just say, say how pretty <laughs> Sasha is. But do leave comments. <laughs> do leave lots of comments if you could. And yeah, shares and retweets, all that sort of stuff. If you can't um, you support us one way, support us other ways, because there's lots of ways to support us. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. We're very excited because as many of you listeners know, there is some uh, stuff brewing in the Netherlands. And so we oh, yeah. have some exciting conversations coming up that address these things, some very important guests. Yeah. So thank you if you've made it to this far into the podcast. I know it's um, been a long conversation. I'm waiting to hear the next two. The, we've got two real biggies lined up. There's yeah, a clue in yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll see everybody next week then. Bye. All right, bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. 
For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.